All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our Unapologetically Progressive series. Uh, today, we've been doing a series of these in a handful of states across the country. Um, today, uh, we're doing Pennsylvania, so I'm really excited. Uh, know a bunch of these folks that we've got on today personally, um, and I promise we've got an awesome lineup ahead of you. Uh, for those of who, you who are watching on Zoom, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat function. Uh, set your settings to all panelists and attendees. Let us know who you are. Um, at the end of this, you're going to get the opportunity to ask questions. So in the Zoom, there's like a little Q&A box. Just click on that, type in your question, and then we'll go from there. Um, we're going to go ahead uh, and get this party started. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Ross morales Riquetto. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of Run for Something. Um, if you're watching, you probably know what Run for Something is, but I'm still going to give you a little uh, rundown on what we do. Um, Run for Something uh, started in the aftermath of the 2016 election. Um, we launched uh, on Inauguration Day in 2017 with the idea that we wanted to recruit and support young, diverse, progressive folks who are running for state and local office for the first or second time. Um, you know, after a lot of sort of like looking at the space and sort of like soul searching my co-founder, Amanda and I realized this was such a big gap uh, in the space. And, you know, we couldn't afford to continue to cede this type of ground uh, to Republicans year in and year out. <clears throat> and so that's how we ended up getting started. You know, we provide all sorts of different like types of support to candidates for those that we endorse, which there are over 1500 folks who we've endorsed. Uh, since we first launched four years ago, um, you know, they get access to a member of the team, uh, a whole host of resources. Uh, this year uh, in Texas and Pennsylvania, we're also raising money for our candidates, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, a little bit later in this. And so, um, yeah, you know, we also do a lot of work around uh, working to recruit candidates like across the country. So we're really, really excited uh, about the elections coming up really really excited about the future uh and you know before we sort of like launch into this uh i do want to take like a moment to thank our host committee um we have a lot of folks who were able to make this possible so leslie beamer wegner chelsea mason trisha o'neill barbara friedgood uh rob joyce connor bronston nick edwards christy edgar uh marjorie sue victoria smith sarah Kuntz, uh, John Hagman, Artine Ar Arbishashi, uh, Tracy Weir, and Jillia Allison. Uh, I probably pronounced a few of those wrong, uh, so apologies. Uh, one thing, you know, before we jump in, we chose a handful of states um, to do some features, like to feature some candidates in. One of them was Pennsylvania, um, it, you know, in part because of what an important state it is, the cycle and just generally. Um, I think it goes without saying that we all know uh, what happened in Pennsylvania in 2016. Um, you know, so like a lot of organizations and folks, we all know that like investing in the presidential uh, in Pennsylvania is really important, but it's not just, you know, the, the presidency that's important. Um, you know, we know that it's imp we're only nine seats away from flipping the Pennsylvania State House, which is actually quite close. Uh, you know, flipping the chamber is important for a lot of reasons. One of them is that, you know, just like flipping it will have an important impact from a policy perspective on millions of people. Um, there's also redistricting implications at play, which I'm sure someone uh, on our panel will talk in more detail about and with more knowledge about than me. Um, and then, you know, we also have, we also know that amazing state legislative candidates like the folks who are on this call right now, uh, going out there and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with voters, whether that's over text or the phone, now that we can't necessarily always be in person, um, is basically the most uh, valuable touch that a voter can possibly get. Uh, and we know that that drives turnout up the ticket. And so all of that type of work uh, helps boost turnout. 
you know, not just for the state house races, not just for the con overlapping congressionals, but also for the presidential ticket as well. And so there's so many reasons why Pennsylvania, why what's going on there is so important. I'm sure a number of our panelists will get to that. If you can hear someone in the background laughing, that's my wife, Jess. She has an amazing laugh. It is also very loud. She is upstairs in our house with her door closed, but you can still hear it. And I can still hear it through my noise canceling headphones. Uh, so with that, um, I will, I think we should just get this party started. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, uh, Shanna Danielson. Shanna is running for state Senate in Pennsylvania in a district that includes parts of Harrisburg. She's a public school, uh, she's a public school music teacher, a mom, a community advocate. She ran, uh, back in 2018 and was also a run for something endorsed candidate then. Uh, and is a founding member of her local democratic club, serves on the state democratic committee, uh, and is uh, an Emerge PA graduate, and we love Emerge folks. So, uh, Shanna, if you want to turn your camera on and just like start, give us a little bit about yourself, why you're running, what your race looks like, um, and then we'll go from there. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, um, and thanks for asking me to be a part of this event tonight. Uh, like Ross said, I am Shanna Danielson. I am a second time candidate, a second time run for something endorsed candidate. Um, but this time is very, very different. Um, I am a teacher by trade. I have a six year old son and I care very deeply about issues for working families because that's what I'm a part of. That's what my life story has been. Um, when I was a kid, the company that my dad had dedicated his career to went bankrupt and we lost everything overnight, our income, our health insurance, our sense of stability. Um, and, and that impacted not only my dad in obviously a lot of really serious ways, but also our family and just our outlook on how the system does or does not work for people who do everything right and still find themselves um, just kind of catching a, a bad break. Um, and so I was able to still graduate and, and attend college. I knew I wanted to teach. Um, I went to a state university and I still have enough student debt to buy a second home. I taught for just under 10 years um, before deciding to to step down before the school year to focus solely on this race. But my time in the classroom was really informative and really kind of shaped um, my whole political outlook. Um, when I graduated from high school, I was a Republican because that's what my parents were and because I wasn't paying attention. And I don't know many high school seniors today who could say the same thing about politics. I think kids are a lot more involved. They're paying attention because we are living in very different times that just demand so much more from us. But when I started teaching, it was, um, I graduated in December 2008, and I think everyone remembers that that was not exactly the friendliest economic time in our nation or in the world, and so it was very difficult finding that first job. Um, and when I got that first job, we then elected a governor who slashed a billion dollars from education spending in Pennsylvania. So my entire career as a music teacher, which is already a subject that is, you know, targeted for cuts um, more than most, uh, my entire career has been in this, you know, the shadow of, of this recession and this constant fear of what's going to happen to our schools because they're not getting enough funding. And something I hear a lot is our schools have plenty of money, but I usually hear that from people who don't spend any time in schools. And so this, this campaign was very much driven by, um, you know, just my personal experiences in my classroom from having to buy my, I have to buy, to like buy the paper to print my concert programs on to, you know, knowing that there are kids who want so badly to participate in band and they can't because they couldn't afford an instrument and my district didn't have them. Um, I personally bought multiple keyboards off of Craigslist and Facebook yard sale sites because my curriculum said you have to teach keyboards, but half of them didn't work and it wasn't in the budget to replace them. Um, and, and this is too common. We we tweeted about this a couple of weeks ago when, you know, the Trump tax scandal broke for the 50th time. You know, I spent more than $750 personally on classroom supplies than the president paid in taxes and, and it went viral. It was in the Washington Post because it's it's crazy to me um, how relatable that is for so many educators. So that's really the issue that that brought me to this, that got me interested in public service. Um, but when I launched this campaign, 
having run for office before um, and you know be, being more and more involved in my community i'm a leader with moms demand action chapter around here um, you know I, I knew that there was more work to be done than what our local elected officials were doing uh, i want to focus on on education on not just public ed but on early childhood and affordable college um, i want to focus on health care on not just access to health care, but everyone having health care and not worrying about going bankrupt if they get sick. Uh, I just watched my dad go through cancer treatments and I can tell you that it's hard enough on your body and on your mind and on your family and the people who love you without having to worry about where you're gonna come up with $13,000 that your insurance company won't cover. Um, you know, I, I'm worried about the climate crisis. I have a six-year-old. I remember vividly a day in homeroom last school year where I had a student look at me and say, why aren't you doing anything about this? When we were talking about collecting donations to send to Australia for the koalas. I mean, the, the kids, have such a, a good handle on what's happening in the world and to have a 10 or 11 year old student look at me and say why aren't the adults doing anything about this broke my heart because i looked i looked at him and i thought yeah why aren't we you're absolutely right um and so you know again these things they're all kind of tied together but they really motivated me to to want to put myself out there running for office is not always super fun, um, but it is very necessary. And especially for folks like me who come from a working class background, women, we don't have nearly enough women in office in Pennsylvania. We need more parents in office. We need more people who are struggling with student debt, who understand the difficult decisions that have to be made when it comes to whether or not we're going to pay rent or buy prescription drugs and um, you know things that i'm sure the other panelists will talk about as well these are the issues that drove us to seek public service and it's just vital especially as we're navigating this covid 19 world that we are we are done waiting for for people to want to sit down and make a deal um we can't play games anymore we are we are losing you know hundreds of thousands of americans we've had several days in a row of over 1300 new cases in pennsylvania after we thought we had a good handle on this we need to just cut the crap we need to sit down and we need to demand that we are prioritizing people as we come through this pandemic and as we move forward and hope to come out even stronger than we were before um so there are a million more things i could say there are a million more reasons why i'm running but you know at the end of the day when i put my son to bed which we did right before this call i kiss him good night and i'm just hoping that what we're doing is making a difference you know we are putting it all on the line in this race when i ran in 2018 it was very much an accountability campaign we have a shot to win this and we are we are doing everything we can do we are making hundreds of thousands of calls and texts and we have a full mail program and you know we're sending tens of thousands of postcards we have hundreds of volunteers because people see the significance not just in me and not just in this race but in this region you know i'm in cumberland and york counties just across the river from harrisburg we're so close to where the decisions are made, but we can feel so far away from the power. But my district is almost entirely nested within the 10th Congressional District, which is one of the most hotly contested races in the country. And we know that if we're going to get Joe Biden elected and be able to push him to enact an agenda that actually works for working people, we have to beat Donald Trump. And that's going to happen here. Hopefully we get voters to turn out in Philly and Pittsburgh, but those of us in other parts of the state know we're not just, you know, we're not just on the sidelines anymore. We're, we're done being just kind of like forgotten about until it's time to find someone to blame when we don't win. We are working, we are activating volunteers and we are leaving no vote um, uncounted. So I'm, I'm grateful to be a part of this program tonight. I'm happy to answer questions when it's time. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity. Fuck yeah. Thank you, Shanna. Uh, and sorry, it took me a second to get my video on, but that got me really fucking fired up. Um, all right, next up, uh, we've got Rick Krajewski. Uh Rick is running for state house in West Philadelphia. He's a neighbor, criminal justice organizer, educator, and artist, which is all of those things together is just awesome. Uh, since 2016, Rick uh, has been an organizer for Reclaim Philadelphia, 
Um, in the 2017 general election, he helped lead a team of 200 volunteers to help elect Larry Krasner for DA in Philadelphia. Um, and now he's running for state house. So Rick, thanks for being here. Super pumped. Uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Ross. Uh, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, again, my name is Rick Krajewski. I am a West Philadelphia neighbor, community organizer, um, run for something endorsed candidate and Democratic nominee for state rep in the 188th district, which is in West and Southwest Philadelphia. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be able to speak with you uh, about my experiences running for office and what led me here. And when I think about one of the politicizing experiences that, that was really instrumental to me making a decision, um, one key moment was how I felt in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election. So uh, as a young black man, I was like many of us uh, appalled and shocked and um, terrified by the rise of white nationalist rhetoric that came with Donald Trump's presidential election uh, four years ago, seemed so much longer than four years ago, but four years ago. And I can remember after the results um, feeling unsafe, feeling like my existence was, was threatened uh, as a black person, as a person of color. And I can remember uh, walking around my city in the aftermath of that election when, we, when, when those results came in and thinking to myself, this is the kind of overt open prejudice that um, my, my grandparents fled the South from. Um, this, this sort of sanctioned and uh, really like encouraged re racist rhetoric that had permeated from our national level all the way down. So as a young black man from a working class background, uh, I felt the need to do more honestly as a matter of, of self-preservation. So very quickly, um, I, I had done some work before around local volunteering with education. Um, I'd done some stuff in my local neighborhood in, in West Philly, but after 2016, I became involved with a local progressive grassroots organization called Reclaim Philadelphia. And since then, I played significant roles in local elections as a means of affecting change. So I was a field organizer in 2017 to elect Larry Krasner as district attorney. Um, he was a local candidate that ran on a very strong progressive uh, transformative platform around the DA's office, calling for things like ending mass incarceration, ending cash bail, ending the practices of, of lock them up and tough on crime tactics, which had been ruling Philadelphia for, for decades. And since his election, the conversation around criminal justice reform in our city has shifted dramatically. Uh, I also volunteered and contributed for several state rep candidates. Uh, folks are gonna be my future colleagues, including the folks on this call. And I door knocked for Governor Tom Wolf during his reelection in 2018. And I served as the campaign chair for Erica Almiron, who ran for Philadelphia City Council in 2019. Um, and I, I lift those up because this local engagement, local volunteering, uh, local organizing around elections and, and progressive movement candidates is a big part of why Philadelphia has become a progressive stronghold powered by the people. The issues of ending mass incarceration, fully funding our public schools, and guaranteeing housing as a human right, they're not fringe and they're not radical in, in Philadelphia anymore. They're just common sense. Uh, but it was becoming clear that there was a real disconnect between the common sense that was taking hold in Philly and a lot of the nonsense that we see in Harrisburg. Um, so because of my values, because of being clear that as a young person in my community in West Philadelphia, that our schools were struggling around being underfunded for decades, for, for years. Um, we had a housing crisis where developers were taking advantage of homeowners and renters alike. And we have a city that is struggling with a minimum wage is not raised, that has not been raised over 10 years. Um, I decided to rise to this occasion and run for office for the future of my community, but also for my own future as well. So galvanized by that, I uh, was able to run a strong grassroots organized campaign that made over 60,000 voter contact attempts. We raised over $185,000 in grassroots contributions 
And in a four-way race against a 35-year incumbent, we were able to win with 47% of the vote. Um, an exciting victory. And I'm very fortunate to say that I do not have a Republican challenger during this general election. Um, so I will be taking office next year. And in the meantime, I have been shifting a lot of my resources to help get out the Democratic vote here in Philadelphia, making sure folks know their rights around registering to vote by mail, around our early voting locations, the satellite offices, and any changes they may have to their polling locations. Uh, because I know that Philadelphia is going to be a, an important key part of turning Pennsylvania blue and, and having it be a real democratic stronghold. And additionally, I've been doing what I can to spread the word and support other candidates like Shanna that are trying to flip key seats throughout Pennsylvania. And this kind of local work of getting movement people to run for office, to get progressives, bold progressives to stand up, um, step up and, and decide to take power is really important because power trickles up. It does not trickle down. So we have to support local candidates. We have to raise independent money. And we have to make sure that our electeds are actually accountable to our vision for the future, not, future, not a future dictated by corporate interests or ideology and ideologues and Republican ideologues particularly. particularly. Um, I know that Run For Something is gonna be a leader in this fight because of the work they have done to support my campaign, because the, of the work that you've done to support grassroots candidates throughout the country. And I really look forward to doing my part to make sure that we expand our, our squad and we, we really change the, the political structure for the better. So I thank you again for giving me the space to, to speak and I'll, I'll hand it back to, to Ross. Thanks, Rick, really appreciate it. And just, just so folks know, I don't, I don't ever call people rep or a representative elect until the final votes are cast um, on election night, even when folks don't have opponents. Um, I was taught at a very early age in politics, you either run scared or you run unopposed, but even when you run unopposed, uh, you, you gotta be out there doing the good work. So Rick is, it's really awesome to see what he's been doing. Um, and with that, uh, we're gonna go to our next panelist, um, who is awesome and you're gonna think is awesome too. Uh, Representative Sarah Inamorato. Uh, Representative Inamorato is currently a state legislator representing parts of Pittsburgh. Uh, she was elected in 2018. Her district looks like a, an uppercase cursive L. Um, it's, a, it's a very fun shaped district. Um, you know, since she's been in Harrisburg, she's championed uh, improving and expanding Medicare for all, a fair tax system, economic dignity through fair pay in a union, affordable housing, clean air and water, and the best possible schools for our children. Uh, and with that, I will stop talking and kick it over to Representative Inamorado. Hi, thank you so much. It's good to see you guys virtually. Um, I am so thrilled to have Rick and hopefully Shana um, joining us in the General Assembly. Um, it'll be awesome. I'm so excited to have reinforcements. And that speaks to the fact that we can't do this work alone. And, you know, to pull from the theme of the campaign that supported Bernie, not me, us. That's the spirit of this entire progressive movement. It's never been about one person. It's always been about putting power back into the hands of working people. And that involves electing more people who understand the grind of what it means to be an average American in this country. And there's not one leader who can deliver that. It takes all of us as citizens realizing our worth in the context of the society and doing something about it. And the way I decided to do something about it was um, running for state representative in 2018. Um, I primaried a very comfortable conservative um, Democrat incumbent. Um, and I did it by putting in the hard work of talking to people who had never been engaged in the political process. Um, and I sought out organizations like Run For Something and asked them to get involved in my race um, and making the case for it. 
Uh, I joined forces with other campaigns like Rep Summer Lee, who's out here in Western PA, and Rep Elizabeth Fiedler, who's out in Philly. Um, we knocked tens of thousands of doors. We talked unapologetically and boldly about the need for a universal health care system, for strengthening workers' rights, for taxing the rich, investing in public transit and public infrastructure. Um, we talked about environmental justice. Uh, we rejected corporate donations and relied on hundreds and hundreds of small dollar donors. And, you know, the thing that I saw that was going that was wrong with government, and I think the root cause of a lot of this tension is that uh, the citizens no longer trust their government. And so I knew that I had to find a way to build trust with um, people who I'd never met before. And to do that, I talked about my life and what it was like to lose my father to his opioid addiction. I talked about what it was like um, to move from place to place as a teenager, which my mom and my sister. I talked about what it was like to struggle to pay student loans in the 2008 recession on only a retail worker salary. And I talked about what it was like to be a working class small business owner in the present day economy. Like Shanna said, this is a, uh, it's the people who understand the precariousness of the American dream. And we didn't do anything terribly innovative, but you know, it worked. We increased voter turnout by threefold and we got 64% of the vote. So we kind of we kind of did a good thing there. And you know, I'm now almost two years into office, and it has been a wild ride to say the least. And we've really tried to take those values in our campaign and translate them, um, those values of inclusivity, of collaboration, of transparency, and really manifest them in the, the district office that we have full autonomy over. Um, so we've set up co-governing tables um, specifically around housing and the housing crisis. Um, in Harrisburg, we've started the Welcoming PA Caucus that's centered around uh, immigrant justice. We've, um, our district office has tripled the amount of outreach that the previous rep had done. And we even hosted a town hall on a bus. And then we had a global pandemic. And that's on top of economic catastrophe. And that's on top of all the crises that were already so deeply embedded in our society, right? Racism, lack of health care, wage stagnation, power and wealth being concentrated to the top, um, environmental destruction, disinvestment in our public sector and our public schools, housing instability. I mean, I could probably use the remainder of my time to just list all of the things that are going on that we're all working on. And all of these things can be traced back to government's decision to choose austerity and corporate interests over the investment of our people and our communities. And, you know, the federal government failed to meet the moment. And in Harrisburg, our Republican leadership also failed to meet this moment in this crisis. While they called us back to session um, to pass tax credits for big polluters, uh, to erode the power of the governor's executive order and attempt to pass legislation to allow them to temper with this, temp, tamper with this election. That all happened while I had hundreds, if not thousands of people calling my district office. They needed help with unemployment. Um, they needed help paying rent. They needed to know how to get PPE and advocate for adequate protections at their, their work that they required to do because they were called essential workers. Um, Main Street businesses that are calling and asking how they are supposed to keep their business, their dream that they've invested everything in afloat, how they're supposed to just survive in this global recession. And you could tell when we would listen to the voicemails, you could hear many of these people were asking for help for the first time and you could hear the pain in their voice. And we are members of the people's house, which means we need to be closest to the pain that our neighbors are experiencing. And if, I've, if, if I'm being honest with you, it's been so hard to be in elected office and to find the words right now to motivate people, to get people pumped up and ready to go because there's so much pain and suffering and we're on the front lines with that. But I have, I found hope in the actions that my community has been taken. I've watched them step up 
They formed a buddy system to check in with lonely seniors. Um, we grew food in our urban garden and distributed it to people who were in need. Um, I've seen mutual aid groups set up to help people in the service industry. And these are the people that I look at for inspiration. And, you know, government should be a reflection of that type of work. It should, it's, a, it's a reflection of us, our values, our priorities, our morals. And if we don't see a government that's reflective of that, it's our duty to change it. And you do that through voting and using the same energy to organize, to govern alongside of the people that we put in power. Right now, I think that our greatest strength is our solidarity and our shared respect for humanity. In the spirit of not me, us, is why, although Joe Biden is not my first choice, um, I will be fighting for him to be elected and to get Donald Trump out of the White House. Um, with Joe Biden in the White House, I know the rules of the game that we're playing, and I know that we have a fighting chance to move the policies. This election is so extremely important, and we have um, so many opportunities, not just to work hard up the ballot, but to actually work down ballot and elect people who impact our day-to-day -day lives. Because if we wanna see more diversity in our progressive leadership, we need to start now. We need to start electing them for state representative, for school board, for your municipal council. Organize around, organizing around these individuals can help the turnout at the top of the ticket too. And we can actually start to build a bench of politicians who are unapologetically bold, unapologetically progressive about introducing a people-centered policy that actually is going to help us build a more just and fair world. And we need all of you who are tuning in tonight to be a part of that. Thank you, Representative. Um... I, all y'all have me fired up right now. Um, really appreciate it. Um, next up, uh, and last but not least, uh, we're going to have Representative Malcolm Kenyatta take us home. Uh, he was elected in 2018 to serve in the State House representing Philadelphia. He currently serves as the Vice Chair uh, of the Philadelphia Delegation uh, and as a member of the Governor's Task Force on Suicide Prevention. Um, as a legislator, he's championed proposals to address generational poverty, raising the minimum wage and protecting workers' rights, increasing access to mental health care, common sense measures to address gun violence and protecting our digital infrastructure. And with that, uh, I will let Representative Kenyatta speak for himself. Thank you so much, uh, Ross, and, uh, and, and thank you to run for something. I have to always you know, start by acknowledging that when I you know, raised my hand to run for something, this organization was literally one of the first uh, to support me. And I'm just incredibly grateful for all of the time and energy uh, that you all have put into making sure people recognize that every, every issue we face is not gonna be solved in the Oval Office. I mean, many of the issues we face are being debated and the battles are gonna be won um, in state houses and in city councils and hold on one second my my I so muted my TV and here it is. We'll be back in one second, folks. Uh, sometimes. Uh, All right, this is our Zoom life. Ross Ross has his amazing wife laughing. I have uh, I have TV, so <laughs> here we go. And so anyway, so you know, thank you. And and to the point that I was making, a lot of these issues, um, they're they're really going to be debated, and 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 the progress we need to win um, is going to be found in city councils, um, in state houses, um, at the school boards, um, and not only in D.C. And I think that that's critically important as we uh, continue to talk this evening. You know, when I think about, you know, why I got involved in politics, um, I think it's really simple. I didn't have a choice. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in North Philly as a poor black gay kid from this community where every single day my very existence um, is a political debate. You know, I watched earlier 
uh, will soon Judge Barrett uh, talk about, you know, sexual preference um, as if being queer is some choice that you make and not how you were uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. And so for me, this is about my life. This is about the life of the people who live in my community um, and about the fact that for so long, I mean, we, we can think of a litany of examples where our communities are targeted with policies that make their lives worse. And I think the Trump administration has been a masterclass in you know, using the levers of political power to really go after folks that are black and brown, go after people who are poor, go after folks who are queer, gender non-conforming, go after folks who are immigrants, go after women. But what I found is that more often than not, folks who, know what it means to live on the margins of our society, we're often just ignored. We're not even a part of the conversation. We're not seen. And so long before I ever decided to run for office, I started talking about issues in my community that I saw that I didn't feel like were being seen. You know, all the way back, I guess in 2013, 14, um, you know, started hosting conversations in my community about generational poverty bringing to, together experts and community organizers and asking our political leaders at the time, like what the hell is going on? And like, what are you gonna do about this? And I come to this from a very real place. I grew up in a incredibly working poor family. And as we you know, talk about the eviction crisis, that's not only around the corner, but that's at many people's front doors right now. I know exactly what that feels like. You know, for my mom to say to us like, we can't stay here anymore, multiple times growing up. Or for my dad, who was a social worker, uh, to go from job to job because his agency's budget was cut and so he couldn't stay there anymore. And, you know, I have three siblings that were adopted um, from the housing projects a couple of blocks from where I still live right now um, because their mom had an issue with substance abuse. And, you know, we weren't really focused in when black and brown communities were suffering under the crack epidemic and were losing loved ones and still continue to lose loved ones to the crisis of gun violence in our communities. And so for me, this is, this is personal. Um, I recognize that everything that happens is political. I recognize that when I think about the fact that so many of our community members are suffering, it is not by accident. And the reality is, you know, when people ask, like, why do these problems persist? They persist because there's somebody making money off of it. There's somebody who is benefiting from us having the economic systems um, and structures that are in place right now. There are folks who benefit when we don't pay people a living wage and they're comfortable with the status quo remaining the same because they're well off and well connected. Um, I'm not, I wasn't. And I never would have expected to be 30 and to have lost both of my parents and to be in this world recognizing that you know everything they taught me, um, I really have to put to use now. I mean, I've told this story probably a thousand times. You know, when I was 11, I was walking around my, my you know, block just and came home, was talking to my mom about like all the issues I saw. And my mom was a tough, a tough lady. And she said, without skipping a beat, well, if you care so much, go do something about it. And I ran for junior block captain. And that was the first thing I ever did. Um, and it gave me the sense at a young age that speaking up mattered, that talking from your lived experience mattered, that being exactly who you are mattered, and that that experience um, wasn't the one I saw on TV. It wasn't an experience I saw reflected in our body politic. But I know a lot of people just like me who are looking for a fair shot and a fair shake and who haven't gotten it. And I'll just end with this note. 
on so much of what has already been covered and what I've covered and what we'll talk about, it's not like we don't know what we need to do. Like, it's not like we don't know and nobody has ever researched how we reduce poverty. Nobody has ever looked into how we emit less CO2 um, into our atmosphere, that nobody has ever figured out these things. What we lack is political courage. We lack political courage. And you get, you get up there um, in Harrisburg and other bodies and it's not there. It's not there. And I'm hopeful that with Shanna winning her election, with Rick and with so many of the other candidates who I've met going all across this state, um, that that courage will be there and will finally do right by the working people who deserve so much more than we've gotten. So I'll end with that. Awesome, thank you so much, Representative Kenyatta, really appreciate it. Um, so for panelists, if y'all can turn your video on, um, we're gonna do some Q&A now, yay. Um, I'm gonna start with a question that I also had written down. Um, you know, when y'all talk to voters, you're all in like really, like very, you're all in very different parts of the state. Um, that sort of like span all across like Pennsylvania. And so would love to hear when you're out there talking to voters or when you're talking to them over the phones or texts, like what are the things that you're hearing from them? Like what are the th issues that they're talking about? And what are some of the things that you're hearing from them that, you know, like probably gets like less coverage um, sort of like in the daily news? Uh, we'll start with whoever wants to go first. So um, otherwise I'll call on someone. I didn't see anyone else on mute, so I'll take it. Um, so I'm like right in the middle of the state and, and arguably no offense to my panelists here. I'm in like the, the place where we have to fight real hard <laughs> um, in, in a, a more conservative area. And it, it surprised me at first and it doesn't surprise me anymore that honestly what we hear most is healthcare. We hear people talking about either, you know, they're, they're not quite ready to say that that we have, we need universal health care, but they're also really mad about how much money they have to spend on health care. So it's, it's trying to find this reckoning with folks on like, we're, we're not saying we want all the free things, right? It's, it, but, but not having these like crazy in-depth policy discussions with someone who's also like on their way home from the grocery store, but they just want you to know healthcare is too expensive. What can we do about this? Um, and, and at first I was like, wow, that's like a top issue for me. And, and it is for these folks too, no matter what their voter registration says, um, healthcare has been, has been a really big one. And then of course, everyone has opinions on, on the reopening um, and what's happening in Harrisburg or maybe what's not happening in Harrisburg uh, in, in terms of, of the recovery and you know, spending this federal money. Um, so those are the big ones for us. I'll hop in next if that's if that's cool. If we're still gonna take time for this one, um, in terms of it's just been a few things that have come up. One uh, is definitely housing. Um, so in the district I'm in, you have uh, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel University, and also University of the Sciences. Um, you have an older Black home owning class. You have a lot of folks in somewhere in between the young and the old that are renters or homeowners. So like. Everyone's affected by housing, whether you're you're someone that's trying to keep up with rising rent or you're someone that's trying to hold on to a home while developers are doing whatever they can to try to swindle you out of it. Um, so that's been a big one. Education, uh, making sure folks can send their to the local school that's down the block instead of feeling like they have to bust them somewhere else to get a quality education is a big one. Um, and then another another one that has been, I think, something that's really been citywide is a, a lot of folks, particularly in Philly, trying to figure out what we need to do about gun violence. Um, it's really been something that has particularly taken a hold of the city over this year. Um, and, you know, it's it's a it's a deeper issue. I mean, you know, Malcolm spoke to it a bit in his his piece around like it's I think we just need to have some political courage and think about like what are the root causes that are causing this thing, whether it's systemic poverty, whether it's mental health, um, and also, you know, readdressing how we, we, we 
engage with violence and, and try to restore them harm in the first place. So those are just a few big ones that have come up in our district that I know a lot of folks are dealing with as well. I would just build on that to say, you know, particularly when we talk about, you know, gun violence, I think what's a little bit underreported is that two thirds of gun related deaths are actually uh, folks who've died by suicide. And so mental health care and making sure that that exists um, is, is something that is a constant discussion because in a community like North Philly, I mean, I represent the third poorest district in the entire Commonwealth. Every single day, folks are traumatized um, by any number of things, getting a shutoff notice, getting an eviction notice, the kid who you know who just got shot down the street. And folks are, in spite of that, getting up every day and still working and trying to move forward. Um, but what comes with that is a lot of toll, a lot of toll. And they, there does not exist the infrastructure or the accessibility for people to go and talk to somebody and get the support that they need. Um, still till today, the worst day I've had since I've been elected is having a mom, a grandmother in my district call me and let me know that her 11 year old died by su suicide. I mean, 11 years old in my district, little Phil, who, I mean, you're 11? and you feel like there's nothing left for you. And so, uh, you know, his family said to me, like, we wanna make sure he's not forgotten. And so I introduced a bill, I'm um, called Phillips Law, where we're trying to completely change the way we do mental health uh, service um, providing in our, in our schools. And that is something that, I mean, we got 90 something co-sponsors for that bill. And you know, we couldn't get a hearing no, we couldn't even get a hearing on a bill that had 90 something co-sponsors. I mean, it is absurd. And this is what I'm talking about. And what's so frustrating about the place where I work right now, we are always doing just nonsense, just nonsense. And it's not even like even pushing Republican bills. We're just like doing nothing. I'm sitting on the floor and I'm like, why are we here? What are we doing? Nothing while people are looking at their families and not knowing what the hell they're gonna do from day to day. Yeah, and to build on Rep Kenyatta's point, like that's, you, you feel that when you're, when you're sitting in Harrisburg, like what the hell are we doing here? Um, there's people back home who are, are in pain. And, you know, I think all of those points, it's, it's housing, um, it's, it's paying rent, it's all of those things. What I've noticed when I'm talking to people is that people just wanna be invited to participate in the process. And maybe it's like a Pittsburgh, which is like the kind of the gateway between like the East and the Midwest is like, people don't wanna bother you with their problems. Like, so you have a really hard time kind of extracting what people are concerned about. Um, but once you in, can tell them what you care about, then they start to open up a little bit and they start to tell you their stories um, about like having their kid who overdosed on opioids or, um, you know, what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. And I mean, to that point, I think a lot of folks just don't understand or they don't, they don't value their work anymore. And I've had to talk to my mom who she runs, um, she works as um, a secretary for an HVAC company. And I don't know how many times I've had to talk to her and be like, you need to ask for more than like $9 an hour because you, you're worth more than that. And, and just to try to convince her that she the work she does is valuable. Like we're in a society that just doesn't value that anymore. And so sometimes people are just so live, so used to living in this broken system. They don't even know what they want, right? They don't even, they don't want to complain about it because they're just like, this is how the world is. And so a lot of it is just kind of like getting them to see that another world is possible and that we can actually, this system was designed by humans and humans and that energy from working people can actually change it. Thanks y'all. Um, that was, all of y'all were really inspiring. Um, 
you know, we have a we have a question for we have another question from someone. Um, so when we flip the Pennsylvania State House uh, in 2020, uh, what is what is sort of like the your top priority um, for what you want to see move uh, in Harrisburg next year? So general assistance, <laughs> like we, that was just one of the, the sickest days. And if folks don't know about general assistance, it really was, you know, you have all Republicans talk about a hand up, a hand up. I mean, this really is a hand up. You know, most of the folks who are applying for this $200 a month were awaiting determinations on federal benefits. These are folks primarily who are permanently disabled, women fleeing domestic violence, veterans who were waiting to get TRICARE or other uh, you know, services from the VA. And what was so frustrating about this is the state gets reimbursed this money. We get the money back. Whenever they get whatever federal benefit they're waiting for, they have to pay all of that back. And so it wasn't even really you know, the state giving anything. We're give, we're helping people with 200 bucks, which is like fucking nothing. Like 200 bucks for a month? Come on, like give me a break. Um, and so you have folks who voted to cut that program and then came over to me personally and say, oh, well, Malcolm, I really didn't want to do it. And you talked about your district and the people in it. And oh, I felt so bad, but my leadership just said I had to, had to vote for it. And I'm like, fuck you. You know, like, forget you. Like, we're sitting here. You know what you're doing is horrible. It's horrid. There's no fiscal justification for it. There's no, like, strongly held political view you have on it. Just somebody told you you had to, and so you did. And because of that, people who are not gonna be able to get on the bus to go to a, a medical appointment, aren't gonna be able to wash their freaking clothes or get deodorant or feminine hygiene products. Like this is what's wrong with our system. When people, it's okay, I mean, it's not okay, but if we have a difference of opinion, we have a difference of opinion. But when you tell me like, oh, I actually agree with you, but so anyway. I will be offering that as an amendment to everything until general assistance is restored and also increasing the benefits because $200 is just a slap in the face. Yeah, that was a really hard fight to have and it, you lost a lot of faith in the other side of the aisle. So sometimes people are like, well, why can't you guys just work together? And it's like, cause I've watched them take votes that are going to kill people. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to reconcile that. It's really, it's really hard and it takes an emotional toll. Um, I mean, I was gonna talk about tax modernization, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. Um, I think, <laughs> I mean, we have had a universal single payer bill that has been introduced every session for the last 10 years. And surprisingly has the support of more, um, I think Dems that, read moderate, but are actually really rooted in um, economic um, populism uh, because they come from like that kind of like blue collar union roots. And someone made the case early on to them that, you know, not having healthcare tied to employment was like a great fucking idea. And they've been signed on to it for, for years. And I was like, we already got like some diversity in this, uh, this uh, coalition. And so there's just a lot of potential there to um, build this coalition within the Democratic Party, because obviously there's different factions of the Democratic Party, um, to build those bridges, do some education with the caucus, and really start to have robust public hearings on that of what steps we need to take in order to make sure that every single Pennsylvanian has health care. Uh, those are both really great answers. <laughs> um, I would say one thing that I definitely would want as a priority is just um, a real like overhaul of our of our justice system from policing all the way to sentencing. Um, we've been able to see some pretty significant change here in Philly, but there's a lot, you know, that my future colleagues are already talking about in terms of like things that get stagnated or stalled or just like deformed in judiciary committees. And it makes it really difficult to like 
I think fully realize this vision that I and, and a lot of folks in, in our city have around just really transforming the way we, we address um, harm, crime, um, the criminalization of poverty, of drug addiction, um, there's just, it just goes all the way down. And it's so connected to some of these other things that we talk about um, when it comes to, to just structural inequality. So I, I would be really thrilled um, when we take democratic control to be able to, to start to get some real headway on that. I will just briefly say everything literally everything. Um, but mostly the thing that drove me to this was was public education. And so from early childhood through public universities, finding ways to make our funding more equitable so that we don't have kids in the same county getting a remarkably different education. I've taught in three districts. Each of those districts has had its own struggles, but it is obscene the difference from a district right next door for what those kids have access to versus what the kids in the neighboring district. So um, we've, we've got to get our, our education funding fair. It needs to all be going through that fair funding formula. We need to find the way to make that work um, because our kids deserve so much better than what they're getting from Harrisburg right now. Thanks, y'all. Um, all right, we've got one last question. Um, you know, like in a couple, like I'll say like in a couple of tweets, um, what's giving you hope right now? Can I go first? <laughs> um, it's been it's been a particularly rough couple of days with like internet trolls. And, and so there are moments where I like look at my campaign manager and I'm like, why am I doing this again? <laughs> like, why am I putting myself and my family? Like people say awful things about my son who's six and adorable. And I get hate mail about the faces on my campaign, like whatever, it's just ridiculous. And so there are moments where you like really question the humanity of the people around you. But then I do an event like this and I'm listening to what's possible when we get people in office who actually care about people. And I feel like I'll swallow these tough couple of weeks and whatever insults people wanna hurl at me on the internet because I know that I'm in this for the right reasons. Um, and just just every opportunity I have to, to be with folks like Rep. Inarato and uh, like Rick and like Rep. Kenyatta, who was in my district just a couple of weeks ago. And that day probably sustained me through the whole week because I just felt such positive energy from that experience. And, and knowing the hope that we're giving people here who for so long have felt like no one cares about them, um, that stuff helps. It makes it a little less terrible when someone calls me a cow on Facebook or whatever, you know, so <laughs> 2020 y'all. <laughs> You call me um, when it happens. Oh, <laughs> well, you, you can rage. You can you can text rage, like, or we can phone rage. It's okay, because it's a really really hard place to be. Um, I think I'm, when I was running, I ended up getting a death threat at some, before my election. It was a whole thing. Um, it's scary out there on the internet, y'all. And um, so you know, I, I think you know, finding these connections with other people. When you run for office, um, you know, kind of the old school consultants kind of feed you this narrative of scarcity. Like there's only enough attention to get, there's only enough money for you. There's only enough like notoriety or, you know, volunteers and you need to just hoard them all. And, you know, just being on an event like this and, and coming in the last two years, it's just been very much about um, how do we work together? And even, you know, Rep Pinata can speak to this too, is like our class, like it does vary an ideology, but it kind of everyone has, who's come up has been wanting to work together. So it's not about my name at the top of the bill, but it's who is gonna be the coalition that's gonna help me move this forward. And that's like Rep Kenyatta and I are working on a bill for like um, civil right to counsel because we both saw the need in our uh, respective cities on tenants going through the eviction process and not having legal representation. And so we're like, cool, let's do this together. And it's just a different way of politicking. And it's much more reflective of the communities and the community energy that we see. 
I, I would just I would just build on that to say, you know, folks like Sh Shanna really are are giving me hope, you know, right right now to 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 the point that Sarah just 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 made. I mean, you know, we've we've my campaign has donated tens of thousands of dollars um, to other candidates who are running. Like, you know, like what the hell does it like? How what use is it for me to have you know all this money sitting in a bank account when there are folks who need to send out mailers and do other things and going around the state and seeing people who are giving of themselves to run for, for office, like running for office is really hard. Like I really hope people understand that. It's very hard. You take so much abuse. Um, like Shanna, when I got when I got married, this picture, when I got engaged, but this this picture of me and my, my partner right here, somebody on the website was like, they look like lesbians or something. So it's just like ridiculous, which is like such high praise because lesbians are wonderful. But, but you know, it, it really is hard and seeing people who are stepping up to run and, you know, how much your families give too, because you're on Zooms and you're knocking on doors and they're not seeing you. Um, is really inspiring. And also I did an event in my, in my district where hundreds of people came out just last weekend around gun violence and were in communities talking to each other about like how we stop these feuds at free communities that are like warring in my district, how we stop these feuds and people from those different areas just coming to like the local community sort of court in the housing complex and just like talking in a real way. That gives me a lot of hope that even though we're running for office and running for office is super important, that people are doing the work in their own communities to fix the issues that exist um, as well. And that really is like what community is about. And so, yeah. Uh, I'll just add real quick. Um, for me, what gives me hope is just knowing that I'm part of like a larger tapestry of, of work that is just going on across the state. Uh, to try to really affect change, um, the work that Shanna's doing to, to win her campaign, um, the work that uh, Reps and Murado and Kenyatta are doing to try to get some more colleagues and get some more backup in Harrisburg, um, and all the organizing and, and work in communities that are happening outside of elections, you know, uh, just knowing that we're all part of something bigger and that uh, when things get tough, I can, you know, look and see that there, there are people doing doing important work throughout throughout PA. So that gives me a lot of hope. Well, uh, I guess I'll answer the question as well. And it's cliche probably for me to say it, but y'all give me a lot of hope. This is literally getting to do stuff like this, getting to talk with y'all is literally one of the best parts of my job, um, especially when the job includes a lot of fundraising, um, which as y'all know is, a soul sucking endeavor. Um, and so, you know, this is, this will get me, this will definitely get me through my week. Um, really appreciate each and every one of y'all's time. Uh, I know that y'all had other things you could be doing. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who tuned in on the Zoom and on Facebook. Um, and yeah, we're gonna, you know, I'll close out by saying you should donate or volunteer for every person uh on this call they're all amazing they're all wonderful you should also give to run for something um robert will drop a link in uh, at the end of this we will send uh an email out that has the volunteer links and donation links for everyone on this call right now uh, or all the panelists that have participated uh and yeah i just want to say you know we've got another one of these coming up uh we're doing uh an unapologetically progressive uh talk for florida um, that will be on October 20th. Um, and yeah, just thank you everyone for taking the time. Really appreciate all of y'all. Um, yeah, and look forward to seeing how things shake out in a couple of weeks. Thanks everyone. Thank you again, uh, Ross and everyone for this. Take care, enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye everybody. Yeah.